from the historic campus of Hillsdale College in Hillsdale, Michigan, where the good, the true, and the beautiful are taught, nurtured, and honored, this is the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour, bringing the activity and education of the college to listeners across the country. The school it becomes known in the community because the students who attend the school are different than many other students in the community. They know how to have a conversation for more than a few minutes. They think of their lives as important and worth planning out and treating with seriousness. This is your host, Scott Bertram, and that's Dr. Kathleen O'Toole, Assistant Provost for K-12 Education at Hillsdale College. We talk with Dr. O'Toole today about the continued and growing interest in charter schools and better define exactly what is an American classical education. Dr. O'Toole, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Pleased to have you back as we discuss uh, these topics just as the school year is beginning in most of the country. We want to talk today about the increased interest in charter schools and perhaps also better define for people what a, what a classical charter is. I wanted to start though with the, the interest in, in charters. We, we, we saw a spike in interest and educational options generally during immediately after COVID. Has that trend continued as far as what you can see? Absolutely. Since COVID and, you know, preceding COVID, but especially heightened by COVID, has been this school choice wave. And parents across the country are more attuned to what's happening inside K-12 schools. And legislatures and other policymakers are paying a lot of attention to new ways to increase parents' and families' ability to choose an education for their child. So we're seeing that in legislation and in uh, local school districts, too. Are there any particular areas or states in which we've seen action movement in the past six months, 12 months or so that parents might want to be aware of? Yeah, Florida is a big one. Ohio is a big one. Arizona has always been a big school choice friendly state, but even more so. And these these movements are very healthy because what they recognize is that there is no one in the world more equipped to make that fundamental decision about where your child should go to school than the people who are taking care of that child day in and day out. There are many different ways to go to school in America today. And parents should have the details about what those children will be taught, what kind of graduate those schools are aiming for before they place their child in a school, because school is so transformative. I saw a study recently about the high number of chronically truant students at public schools across the country, and the numbers are high everywhere you look. And a thought occurred to me that increased choice, the availability of charters, parents making decisions like the ones you outline, and students helping perhaps in those decisions too, would would lead to students attending schools that better suit their needs and might help this particular problem of chronic truancy. Yeah, I think that's a I think that's a very good point. The nice thing about parent choice regarding schools is it, it signifies that that is a major decision rather than having it automatically happen because of the neighborhood in which your home is located. You actually as a family go through and look at what are the options, and then you make a decision about this one, and that's kind of a moment of commitment. Now, it's inappropriate for a moment of commitment to happen at the beginning of the education because the education itself is going to require a lot of commitment, mm -hmm. particularly if it's a serious education, which is what a classical education is. One of the things that I think we we very easily forget, and this may be part of the reason for so much truancy in this country, is that education is not something that is done to a child. Mm -hmm. If a child is going to learn, it is because that child has, has done the activity of learning. Now, we as, as parents, we as teachers need to help them by create, creating the conditions in which it is healthy and, and possible to learn. We, we make sure that our schools offer a cohesive curriculum. We make sure that the curriculum builds upon itself year after year. We make school a fun and engaging place to be, but also a place that 
indicates the seriousness of the, and the worthiness of the endeavor of learning. And when you get all of those things right, then the student can participate in this essential activity of learning. Talking with Dr. Kathleen O'Toole, Assistant Provost for K-12 Education at Hillsdale College. Hillsdale K-12 assists classical schools across the country offering an American classical education. So what does that mean and what is classical education? Well, classical education is a funny term. It, it didn't exist when I was going to school in the 80s. Maybe it did among a few small homeschooling groups, but it, it wasn't a commonly used term. And today you hear it pop up all over the place. It, it's a new name for an old idea. The old idea is that the right education for a young person is a liberal education, a well-rounded education, one that helps you encounter all of the subjects in their depth and that recognizes that school is more than just learning information. It's also shaping your mind and your heart in the direction that that you will be pointed, for better or worse, as an adult. And so a classical education is not an education f which specializes until we have a solid foundation across the sciences, humanities, the arts, and the languages. And it's also an education that pays attention to the student's character as well as the, the mind or the intellect. It's a beautiful thing that this term has become a, a, a common term, but it does sound, when you when you talk about it, it does, and the fact that it's new sometimes makes people think that this is a new approach to education. Mm -hmm. It's not at all. It's the way that basically everyone used to go to school in America two generations ago. It's the way my grandparents went to school. Yeah. It's the way it's the way their parents went to school. And so it's a, it's a new name for an old thing. So if that is classical education, what isn't classical education and where are there perhaps some misconceptions? Yeah, well, classical education is, so first of all, it's it's for every child. A lot of people do not have this impression because for a long time, classical schools were only available, classical education was only available in private schools. And so you had to have a certain SAT score or a certain income level to get in. And that sort of gave the indication that maybe it was only for, you know, a certain type of kid. The classical charter movement in which Hillsdale is a is a healthy participant, um, is showing that this approach to education, this well-rounded, tried-and-true approach works for every kid, no matter where they come from, no matter what their individual talents and abilities. It's a human education, and students are human, so it's good for them. So that, I think, would be the first misconception. Another misconception is that a classical education is more attuned to the humanities than to the sciences. So people think classical schools are for the kids who like words and letters and reading and mm -hmm. writing. And if you're more of a math or science or STEM kid, maybe you should look elsewhere. The math and science that happens in a classical school is more fundamental and in many cases more advanced than the math and science that would happen in even a, a STEM-focused school. And we regard the sciences as an important opportunity for encountering reality. And so we think that if you if you are overly focused on the humanities, you're missing an essential component of, of a liberal education. And Dr. O'Toole, what about this idea that there's explicit political instruction, explicit religious education in these classical charter schools? I'll talk about political first. So it is important to recognize that in the K through 12 years, students need to be receiving an education from which they can enter adulthood in a competent and healthy way. And we do this by learning the basics. We So therefore, when we talk about politics, when we talk about history, when we talk about any subject, we begin with the fundamental things. Today, there are many, many stories of teachers bringing politics into the classroom. And in our view, that's a really damaging thing to do because the thing about the controversies of the day is that they are hot and they are temporary. Mm -hmm. And the K through 12 years are actually, it's actually not a lot of time 
in those K through 12 years. And if you spend your classroom time talking about the temporary things and the fiery things, you will rob students of the ability to understand politics or history or any any of these subjects in the foundational way that they are supposed to be learning them when they're young. And then on the second charge, the idea that there is explicit religious education happening in these classical charter schools, how do you respond? Absolutely not in a in a charter school. You know, charter schools do not bring religion into the classroom in a proselytizing way. Um, they their their task is to teach the truth about the world. Um, and so in Hillsdale's affiliated classical charter schools, it's a it's a non-religious environment. And that's that's what you would expect and what is required mm. out of any charter school, any public school in America. Talking with Dr. Kathleen O'Toole, Assistant Provost for K-12 Education at Hillsdale College on uh, what a classical charter is. If you were to visit a properly run classical school, what might someone experience and what differences might they see if they're visiting a classroom? The first thing that you would notice is that the students really enjoy being there. Um, you would notice that it's a place of order, but without being harsh. You would notice that it's a place of joy without being silly. Uh, and you would notice that the conversations that are going on are, first of all, human conversations. We don't have our cell phones or iPads or laptops in front of us in a classical school because we're there to think about ideas and talk to people. And the conversations that naturally happen after a school is established and students are working their way through the great books and the great ideas are really worthy, serious conversations. You would notice that the parents are interested in the curriculum because their children are coming home full of interesting things to talk about around the dinner table. You would notice that the teachers are, the teachers think of the school as a place where they will be for the long term because they have known these students since they were in kindergarten mm -hmm. and they plan to know them until they graduate from high school. You would see that the school is active all the time. And the, the, things that it, the things that it is active with are worthy things, whether it's, you know, fine arts or athletic competitions. Everyone's all in, and they're working hard together to do it well. I think also you'd notice that the school it becomes known in the community because the students who attend the school are different than many other students in the community. They know how to have a conversation for more than a few minutes. They have the attention span that's required to read a book. Mm -hmm. They speak to each other and to adults with respect. And they're they're thinking about worthy things. They, they think of their lives as important and worth planning out and treating with seriousness. You alluded to earlier the misconception about Classical schools are for STEM, or classical schools are for humanities, maybe not for STEM. We talked about that. What about the idea that classical schools aren't for every level of student, at least current level of student, students who are perhaps underperforming classmates or students who are overperforming classmates? Is a classical education possible for every kind of student academically? Yeah, absolutely. And another thing that should be mentioned about this classical curriculum is it begins, because we're we're very serious about teaching and we're very serious about curriculum and getting the curriculum in the right order. Today in America, most students are woefully below their potential when it comes to reading and woefully below their potential when it comes to math. And that's not because they're not intelligent. It's because the way that we go about teaching reading and math in this country is mostly wrongheaded. Mm. Hillsdale schools are very, very serious about teaching phonics. We're very, very serious about teaching mathematics. We use Singapore mathematics. And the, the pro these programs that we use are, I mean, the results are just amazing. I mean, most children, including children with dyslexia, are reading by the second semester of kindergarten. Most children are computing and doing arithmetic at or above grade level 
by a couple of years of doing Singapore math. And listen, that's not because we're rocket scientists. It's because this way of doing it is the correct way of doing it, and we're being careful about making sure the teachers are trained to do it well. It is actually not hard to teach a child to read if you have the right approach. <laughs> That's a little about student results and how students can succeed. What do we know, certainly with the Hillsdale schools, uh, the K-12s, about parent satisfaction with the schools themselves? The parents, the parents love the school. Now, I don't want to paint an overly rosy picture here. Uh, it is hard to go to school. And it is hard if you are a parent to enroll your child in a classical school because these schools don't take shortcuts. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's harder for students, especially initially. And it's sometimes harder for the family because all of a sudden we're having to take our schoolwork seriously and we're not taking shortcuts. Now, I want to be very clear about this. Sometimes people get the idea that classical schools make it hard to try to show you know, maybe you won't be able to cut it or something. And, you know, it's very important that the school doesn't artificially make it challenging. But while recognizing that the act of learning, the act of becoming an educated person is one of the most important things that you do as a human being. And it's worth doing well and of course it's difficult. Mm. You're shaping your, your heart and your mind mm -hmm. over the course of your life. That is the thing to do if you are going to be a happy human being, which of course we all want to be. And so it is a commitment on the part of the child, on the part of the, of the family, on the part of the community, on the part of the teacher to have a classical school. But it's a commitment that we must make if we are going to raise these children and educate them in the way that they need to be educated if they're going to be well-rounded, happy people. Talking with Dr. Kathleen O'Toole from Hillsdale's K-12 effort, the website k12.hillsdale.edu. If people go there, there's a lot of information and resources. What's available over there from Hillsdale K-12 at the website for, for parents and students who are curious, uh, parents and students who might be even homeschooling. What, what kind of resources are available there at the K-12 site? Well, there's a lot on the website. If you're interested in learning more about classical education and maybe even bringing a little bit of it into your home as a, as a, as a family or into your classroom as a teacher, we produce a free comprehensive uh, American history curriculum. We produce a civics curriculum. All of that is downloadable and usable right now. The lesson plans, the readings, the questions to ask yourself as a teacher are all laid out for you. We have a book list on there. If you are the parent of a, of a young child who's wondering, what kind of books should I put in front of my four, five, six, seven, eight year old? Um, there, there's a list of selected books from the curriculum along with all of the ISBN numbers. And so spend some time reading with your child from the books on that list. You will find them, if you are a parent or a teacher, enjoyable because they're real literature we're thinking about. And uh, your children will benefit immensely from having that quality literature in front of them. You can read about the entire curriculum on the uh, on the website. And if you go to the classicalclassroom.com, that's our blog, and it's written by teachers and um, others in our schools, and it gives you a sense of what classical education is like behind the scenes. Dr. Kathleen O'Toole, Assistant Provost for K-12 Education at Hillsdale College, thank you for joining us here on the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Thank you. Up next, we talk with Carrie Gress, her new book, The End of Woman, How Smashing the Patriarchy Has Destroyed Us. I'm Scott Bertram. This is the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Hillsdale College is a small, Christian, classical liberal arts college that operates independently of government funding. And we want you or your son or daughter to apply. At Hillsdale, students grow in heart and mind by studying timeless truths in a supportive community dedicated to the highest things. Hillsdale College costs significantly less 
than other nationally ranked private liberal arts colleges and receives regular recognition as a best value and nearly all students receive financial aid. Our robust core curriculum, vibrant student life, and eight to one student to faculty ratio make for an education like no other. For more information or to fill out an application, visit hillsdale.edu backslash info. That's hillsdale.edu backslash info. Welcome back to the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. I'm Scott Bertram. Be sure to check out podcast.hillsdale.edu. That's where to find the Hillsdale College Podcast Network. You can find older episodes of this program, as well as other great Hillsdale podcasts like Primus, The Larry Arn Show, and Hillsdale Dialogues, all at podcast.hillsdale.edu. We're joined now by Dr. Kerry Gress. She is a fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center, a scholar at the Institute for Human Ecology at the Catholic University of America, and the author of the new book, The End of Woman, How Smashing the Patriarchy Has Destroyed Us. You can also find her work at kerrygress.com and theologyofhome.com. Kerry, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Early in The End of Woman, in the introduction You say it's time for honest women to recognize that feminism has not been the boon for women that it has been presented as. And much of the book goes into details. But why has it been so? Why have we been told all these incorrect things for so long? Yeah, no, I think that's the big question, isn't it? Part of that question comes from just looking at what's happened to women in in general. I think we have absolutely seen a decline in the happiness for women. There was a big study done in 2009 about it, and it, it, these statistics just keep increasing in terms of depression numbers, suicide levels, substance abuse. You know, all of these things are really pointing towards women who are incredibly unhappy. And I think, you know, the idea has been that the more feminism we have, the more happy women will be. You would at least hope that that would be tracking. You know, that those, there would be some sort of correlation between the two. And and we're really just not seeing that. And then, of course, the other problem is just the um, incredible rift that feminism has made between women and men and women and children. And, um, you know, you can't really build a culture and a civilization off of, um, you know, half the population feeling deep anger, bitterness and resentment towards the other half and then vice versa. This is, you know, no way to, to actually build something. So anyway, I think a lot of this has been polished over or neglected, you know, it just doesn't really fit the narrative that's being pushed. And so people haven't been looking at it. And that's really what I wanted to do in, in this book. The book is broken up into four parts and roughly half the book or so focuses on part one, the early development Mm -hmm. of feminism following the lives of the most influential women of that time. These women involved in the feminist thoughts, you say that a pattern emerges as you study them and give them this this, mm-hmm. this phrase, the lost girls. What pattern do you mm-hmm. see in these early women of feminism? Yeah, so this was something I had no idea existed. I, ha- I was not in, a, in any way expecting to find any sort of negative details about feminism in the first wave, because I think we've been told over and over again that the second wave is really where the problems are. And um, so I went back thinking, you know, I just need to do my due diligence and really focus on the first wave and, and, you know, dig deep and see what's there. So there were three things I found. The first one was really the evidence and prevalence of the occult, starting with, you know, the early 1800s, actually, with Percy Shelley, who is the the son-in-law of Mary Wollstonecraft, which is a whole story in and of itself, how the two of those are connected, because they certainly never met Mary Wollstonecraft died giving birth to later Mary Shelley. But um, he's he's very involved in the occult. You see it in Elizabeth Cady Stanton and, and Susan B. Anthony with involvement in seances. And then it, it just sort of flows through to the, the current day with all of this, you know, witchcraft and, and goddess worship. That's one. Um, the second one is this idea of free love. And uh, Mary Wollstonecraft's husband, William Godwin, was actually one of the loudest proponents of free love and getting rid of marriage and getting rid of monogamy. And, of course, Percy Shelley picked that up, and that was just something that was, you know, woven in and out of the movement throughout um, the centuries. And then the final one is this idea of smashing the patriarchy, which is what Mary Wollstonecraft was very explicit about. Um, She's writing at the time of the French Revolution and is trying to, 
you know, make an argument that we need to get rid of things like the church and the military and, and, and any of these institutions that are really using the gifts of, of men to order society. And that became eventually the same idea of smashing the patriarchy. Interestingly, the word patriarchy was used in a negative form by Engels, actually. And then that it's just been used ever since in a negative form because feminism then grouped with, with communism and Marxism. Uh, in the 1900s. So there's a lot of complicated pieces, but those were the three that I found were most common throughout the two, the 200 years of, of feminism. I think really if you have to de- define and distill feminism down into something, that's, that's it. We usually think of it more in terms of, you know, we just want to help women, but there's actually a very specific sort of recipe that that's been used over, over the decades for that. You, you write in part one about Betty Friedan in, in, in her section about mm-hmm. uh, the, the influence of, of communism and this yeah. thought that women would only be truly free when they entered the paid workforce. When mm-hmm. or, or how does mm-hmm. some of this change from perhaps a desire to help women to a desire to enact this social change? Yeah. Well, I, I think the first thing is that the other big question that the feminists were asking was, how do we help women, but how do we help women become like men? And that was in the 1800s. But then in the 1900s, you see this sort of linking with communism. And Friedan is writing at a time when you know she hates Hitler, but she loves communism and the Communist Party. She's very involved with them. And she, there was in in her notes is a, a quote from Engels talking about the same idea of uh, you know women will only be free when they are outside the home. And so she's writing this, trying to get women out of the home because that's the ideology behind it. And she did it in a very masterful way using psychology. You know. There was a, a great quote by Simone de Beauvoir who said, you know, if women are given the choice to stay at home or to leave, they will absolutely stay home. And so Betty Friedan took the task upon herself to sort of make it appealing to women, you know, saying, really focusing on that idea of, you know, women seeing themselves as victims if they're at home. She actually called the home a comfortable concentration camp, mm-hmm. um, which is astounding that she could get away with that. But um, the whole idea behind it being that that work was really where we were, were meant to be. And so that's kind of the, the trajectory that it went in was this this belief that that's how women will be made happy and cutting off, again, this our deep relationships with our children and, and husbands was just kind of how things got swept up into it. So they, she authentically thought she was helping women using Marxist ideology, which ironically was also Hitler's ideology that she presumably hated. You know, that, that gated Auschwitz that says the work will make you free. Um, that's exactly what she was promoting. Right near the end of part one, there is a subsection, Lost Girls Make More Lost Girls. You tell the story, mm-hmm. oh, well, Stevie Nicks tells her story that you that mm-hmm. you, that you you republish uh, about yeah. her life and uh, her, her abortions and what she lost during that time. And mm-hmm. Stevie Nicks also often is held up as this example of a woman who, who, had it, who has it all, had it all, who had this yeah. amazing career and made tons of money and was world famous. And when you talk to her about this, it doesn't seem to me, perhaps to you, that she's at mm-hmm. peace with all the decisions she made through this through the, through that time. Yeah, no, this is a really remarkable article I found from the 90s that someone had, had done with her. And, uh, you know, it's amazing because she talks very specifically about how she just couldn't give up her job to have children, to stop to have children. And then she had the abortions. And then I think it was with four different, four, four different abortions with four different boyfriends. And that the men just couldn't handle it and all ended up leaving her. And, you know, she's obviously been in and out of drugs, drug rehab over the years, too. But I think the thing that struck me the most was just to see the the way that she lives her life. Apparently her home, she she describes it, is very much like a doll's house. There's this very, like, little girlness about her. Even when she would go on the road, a team of people would have to go and arrange her hotel room to look like a little girl's room. Um, you know, and this is just not a normal, healthy functioning adult to have to have that sort of environment created for you everywhere that you go. Um, so it's really astounding to just see someone like that. Like you said, it's been wildly successful. You think has it all. And yet there's a really big crack, you know, in that personality that the, these things clearly have not made her a wise, healthy, hmm. you know, woman that people should emulate. Carrie Gress is with us. Her book, The End of Woman, How Smashing the Patriarchy Has Destroyed Us. All of that in part one as you move to part two, The Mean Girls. You say Mm -hmm. feminism proposes to fix women's problems without having the right solution. How how do they propose to fix Mm -hmm. and why do they have the wrong solution? Yeah. 
Well, I think this, again, goes back to that idea of wanting to make women like men. If you look at the last 50 years, all the efforts of, of, of changing and directing womanhood have been to make us more like men. It's really this idealization of the, the masculine and this belief that, you know, men have are freer and happier because they don't have fertility to deal with. And so this is why we see just the, the importance of um, birth control and abortion, for sure, um, because it's a matter of, of managing and controlling and, and, you know, our fertility and children, because, again, children are presented to us as, as a real obstacle to our happiness instead of a means through which we can find it. So that that's where, you know, things get really mean and ugly because <laughs> you're talking about people here. You're not talking about a tumor, you know. Um, and, and so we see this play out in, in vicious ways. But we it also, you know, moving forward, I think it, it becomes very clear that this is one of the reasons why the trans movement is happening so easily, you know, partially because most of us have stopped thinking of ourselves in terms of our, our fertility or our maternity. And, you know, we're even sort of told it's weird to do that, like, Look at the Handmaid's Tale. You know, it's sort of that the, the feminists have controlled their message, but they've also controlled what they think is the opposing message, which is, you know, we're all going to end up in fertility cults with red robes and red bonnets, kind of thing. So that's where, it, again, there's all these major distortions, but they have to continually be made because the the message and the, the narrative is not authentic and, and true and compelling and, and beautiful. And so when we see these girls now who are wanting to transition into to boys. Abigail Schreier has said in her book, Irreparable Damage, these girls don't want to become boys so much as they just want to be non-women. They don't want to deal with, you know, adolescence and all the awkwardness that comes with that. You know, we, we, we just haven't presented them with something that looks like, you know, a wonderful life of a woman. And so they're just rejecting that in a way that is very consistent with what we've been given the last 50 years under second wave feminism. In the Mean Girls chapter, you talk about the, the fear tactics, e- equating the mm-hmm. end of reproductive choice with authoritarianism. And then after that, talking mm-hmm. about the, the tribe, women who fall out of step with other women who, who, who yeah. don't want to. And the queen bees, that was yeah. a wonderful uh, section, mm-hmm. the, the queen bee TV, mm-hmm. the view. Why is it that mm-hmm. so often, overwhelmingly often, we do only mm-hmm. see women through one lens in media? Yeah. Yeah, no, this is a huge question that I think is super important for you know everybody that, that takes the culture seriously needs to, to look at. because Partially because they've been so effective in managing their narrative and making sure that it gets out there. If you, if you disagree with them, they will either ignore you or destroy you. That's just sort of how it works. This is sort of the queen bee mentality. And they feel personally threatened by it. You know, there's, there's all these tactics that are used. And most of them are kind of under the table. Um, ways of, of manipulation. One of the, the most common ones that, that I hear actually regularly is just this idea of, of guilt. You know, you need to feel guilty because feminism gave you all these opportunities for you to get your PhD and for you to be able to work out of the home and, you know, all of that. And I just think this is crazy because all that does is it, it cl- shuts down conversation. And so people aren't able to talk about those things and say, like, but these things could happen, and many of them were happening under sort of a natural law understanding of the world. We didn't have to completely destroy the whole civilization <laughs> to to achieve these things, you know. And shame on us if we really think that, you know, if I thought my degree was worth destroying all of uh, all these human lives. I mean, the, the internationally we abort something around seventy three million babies a year. About 60 million to 65 million people die from every other cause combined. <laughs> so we actually are aborting about 10 more million babies than people are dying of natural causes. And, you know, just to give you a, a, a scale, there's 69 people, 69 million people in the UK. So imagine we're wiping out all of the UK every year. I mean, that's, that's the scale that we're talking about. So it, it's, it's pretty amazing to sort of try and make these comparisons. And I think that that's the real tragedy that they have been able to be so successful in shutting down conversations about this and really looking at it in, you know, healthy human terms. Um, but again, they, they control politics, they control Hollywood, fashion industry, you know, every way in which women get information, even the publishing industry. Uh, you know, I've had people tell me they couldn't get their books published because they had a pro-life ending, that these are all controlling the message and women just sort of fall in line over and over again. And as conservatives, we are not adding to it. We're not, I mean, we are not fighting this with our own 
messaging, and this is what I've done with my books on, called Theology of Home, is try to make something like a, a magazine. You know, women love visuals. We love rich ideas, but they don't have to be a whole book. You know, they could be snippets, and that's mm-hmm. what Theology of Home has done, and it's been very successful. But I think women are really starving for this. We want content that has a much better message, and we just don't know how to go about doing it. So I think there's a, a really incredible market and opportunity for us to start getting more involved in pop culture instead of allowing the left to just continue to bulldoze the whole thing. Carrie Gress is with us. Her book, The End of Woman, Part 3, No Girls, uh, this idea mm-hmm. of e- erasing uh, women, erasing uh, femininity. What do you make yeah. of this trend that we see of of lawmakers and leaders and sometimes legislation mm-hmm. written in a way that refuses to say the word woman, menstruating people, yeah. people with a period. Yeah. What do you make of this, right. this these euphemisms yeah. now being used? Yeah, no, I mean, I think this is just the the, the next step in the ideology is just this idea of, of erasing gender entirely. And the feminists made this very clear in the 70s that this is the direction in which they were going, women like Kate Millett talked about this and and other, you know, major figures in the movement. And that's what they've been pressing for. And this is, you know, where it leads to when you're trying to erase gender entirely. And so this is why it's become so important for people that are are focusing on this ideology to to stay in mind with it, because even though it's, you know, obviously, you know, there's a pretend element about it that we all have to sort of overlook in order for it to somehow be true. Um, but yeah, that's it, it's really the the culmination. It's really finally asking this question in a biological sense: How do we make women men and men women? So it's it's the end of the goal. This is you know 200 years in the making, and it's interesting to see sort of this infighting among the feminists who are pro-trans and those who are not, like J.K. Rowling. You know, this sort of bloody battle that's playing out because of this impasse. So I think yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see what happens because. It just feels like there's a lot of power on the the trans side of things, and this is where like the normal among us need to start really speaking up and just you know doing what we can to prevent this continued you know mirage of, of reality from becoming even more steep, deeply steeped into our our laws. The final part is the way home. What do we what do we do about it? Very interesting that you mm-hmm. write. Uh, years ago, your daughter asked you, "What is better about being a girl than a boy?" And you didn't have an answer, and that puts you on this path yeah. of thinking and working through that question. How would you answer her today? Yeah, <laughs> yeah you know, I I think that the the amazing thing is just to look at women as a composite, you know, body, soul, spirit, and just see all of those pieces together. Because that's really what, what feminist philosophy is trying to do, is sort of parse these out and take them apart, and and uh, now even chopping them up. But I think that there's women have this beautiful capacity. We can see it in our arms, the way we cradle a baby. Our arms are shaped differently than men. That, you know, our wombs to hold, that give first life to, to a child in the first home. Women are, are made to uh, protect shelter and provide, you know, a way, a nourish really, uh, provide a way for people, other people around us to become who they're meant to be. Um, we do this biologically, but we also do it psychologically and, and spiritually. I think those elements are really missed. And this is what's being erased is this idea of motherhood. And I think the, just even the incapacity of people to define women using that word really tells us a lot. But we can also see a lot from the negative, you know, what's happened with women. A lot of women are finding surrogates in pets. We even have this new term, plant parent. Hmm. So I, I think women are still showing clearly we have this deep desire to mother something. Um, it's just been so thwarted by the culture that we, we found sort of surrogates for it. Um, we spent $700 million on pet costumes at Halloween every year in this country. So I, I think it's it's very clear that that's the direction things have gone. And, but it, it shows us that the, the female heart hasn't been changed by all these efforts. It's just been redirected into something certainly less worthy than, you know, raising, raising our own children. Um, so, yeah, I think that that's, that's the key piece is really understanding that role that we have as mothers um, in, in terms of being able to help those around us become better people. Final question for Carrie Gress. Her new book is The End of Woman. You say that much of your book focuses on female power. The problem is that we, females, haven't used our power properly. What's the proper exercise 
of female power. Yeah. yeah, well, I think that the way power has been used has been just to control and to, to manipulate. I mean, this is what we've seen, and it makes uh, cases made, made very clearly in the book, I think. But I think the, the proper way is, again, that idea of service and, and loving others and uh, allowing the gifts that we have to build up the lives of, of others. And that's really where you start building culture and, and you know, seeing the beauty of of what a woman does through her motherhood. I mean, most of the time, mothers don't really see the, the fullness of what they've done because they, you know, they die before their children and grandchildren, great-grandchildren come about. But the, the fruit remains. And um, I, I think that that's the the aspect that we've really lost sight of is when a woman is virtuous, that there's going to be amazing and incredible fruit from it. Um, we're just not used to seeing it. So I think that's the exciting, really, opportunity that we have is to be able to start representing that and helping sort of fill up the, the moral imagination again with what it means to be a woman and creating this new new grammar. Um, I, I think that's that's the, the next, that, that's what has to happen next because we've, we've allowed it to to be vapid for so long, but it's, it's all right there for us. Dr. Carrie Gress, the new book, The End of Woman, How Smashing the Patriarchy Has Destroyed Us. You can also find her writing at carriegress.com and over at theologyofhome.com. Carrie, thanks so much for joining us here on the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Thanks so much for having me. That will wrap up this edition of the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Our thanks to Dr. Kathleen O'Toole, Assistant Provost for K-12 Education at Hillsdale College, and Carrie Gress. She's the author of the new book, The End of Woman, How Smashing the Patriarchy Has Destroyed Us. The Radio Free Hillsdale Hour is recorded at the studios of WRFH, the student-run radio station at Hillsdale College. Remember, you can hear new episodes every week on this station, You also can find extended versions of some of our interviews or listen anytime to the podcast. Find it at podcast.hillsdale.edu or wherever you get your audio. Until next week, I'm Scott Bertram, and this has been the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour.